first speaker is from Sichas from the University of Leipzig, and he will talk about real and artificial interactions of artificial microphones. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome back from the coffee break. And thank you, of course, uh, giving me the chance to present the poster, which was actually intended as a poster here in live form. So it's about real and artificial interactions of uh, micro swimmers, and it's somehow related to uh, one of the major topics of this uh, conference here about collective motion, which I would possibly break up uh, into uh, uh, different objects here on one side, uh, starting with animals, coming down to the micro swimmers here on that side, having some biological cells here on the other side, and I would break that down into that uh, two ingredients, you would actually need an active motion or propulsion, which is the easy part probably, and uh, the complicated interactions which make up uh, the things we've seen today and a uh, couple of other days uh, as well. And um, the interactions are actually complicated because in my simple view they consist out of uh, different things here which are visualized actually by these different objects. These are non-physical interactions as I would call them and they are uh, are also physical interactions in these systems. So the kind of feedback or sensory related systems are these here, and maybe also these, but most of these here uh, consist just out of uh, physical interactions. Uh, just they bump into each other, they have attraction or repulsion. Uh, that are the two things which we are actually interested in because we want to control at the end these interactions and maybe also introduce these kind of feedback or uh, sensory interactions in systems which are on the micro or nano scale. So these systems mainly have uh, feedback-based interactions, but these mostly physical interactions. And we would study, uh, like to study these physical interactions here in these systems, first of all, to characterize them and find a way how to control these particles even in large ensembles in the way we uh, would like to do that. So the, the system we've chosen for that is a particular swimmer, which is a genus particle, of course, uh, it works like that, so it consists out of plastic bead and has a gold cap on the, the back side and the gold cap can be heated by a laser very easily. So you can switch up, uh, switch on and switch off uh, the heating very easily. You see here the temperature profile which arises and the reason why this object moves in the liquid like water is the following. You have the hot and the cold side here along that uh, interface and uh, the heat moves from the hot to the cold side and uh, in the other direction of the heat flow goes a, a so-called thermosmotic flow on the surface, uh, which is the same as any other kind of osmotic flow, only here it's uh, the heat content which moves uh, the liquid at the end. And this creates a, a surface flow here, just directly at this interface, uh, or everywhere here at this, this interface in principle where you have the temperature gradient. And that gives you the boundary condition, which you have to sum up here, or some formulas to do that which uh, uh, creates a final flow field here around that swimmer, which looks like that. Yeah. So this is all calculations so far. Uh, the experiment looks like this. This is a dark field microscopy uh, image. So the, the bright side you see here is just the gold side. The darker side is just the polymer side. And the polymer side is always in front. That is the reason why, uh, or it's for that reason, that the uh, uh, thermosmotic flow goes here from the uh, cold to the hot. And therefore, the particle has to move to the other side. So uh, we like that particle or that swimmer because we can control and we understand that pretty well. We can even measure the flow fields around a fixed particle. So you see that kind of pumping a fixed particle will do and characterize that really well. And we know how to control that, and that's the issue behind uh, the whole story I wanted to present. Here uh, we can control them to understand the interactions of individual swimmers. So we've seen that the phase behavior of uh, such collective ensembles uh, depend on these interactions, and we would, would just like to find out what are the interactions between individual swimmers. And I would break them down even into uh, three sub-categories. Uh, the first one is a substrate-mediated uh, kind of interaction. That is due to the fact that whenever you have your, a gradient on the surface and your swimmer is close to the substrate, you also have a gradient along the substrate. So uh, whatever this gradient is here, in that case, case is the temperature gradient, it will also uh, cause a thermal osmotic flow along that substrate. And you can see that in an experiment, I don't want to go in too much into detail. So there are lots of colloids which are passive with just one swimmer here in the middle. And as soon as the swimmer starts to, um, uh, starts to swim, it collects all the passive particles by this thermal osmotic flow at the interface. So I don't want to go much more into that detail. The next um, uh, interaction is a hydrodynamic interaction. Of course, that flow field creates some interaction with another particle. Uh, that's also something which I uh, would not like to address. We've seen uh, hydrodynamic effects uh, during the conference. Uh, the only thing I would like to address is uh, this part, which is uh, the phoretic one, 
which means that we have some gradients, some temperature gradients, which this particle creates, and this temperature gradient causes some action on a second particle or a second swim. Uh, and we would like to measure that in a very simple way. Uh, we would like to simplify this one active swimmer into a heat source, which is uh, just a representative of this one, a bit easier, and that heat source is just fixed on a surface. It's a gold particle which you can switch on uh, with the heating and uh, then study the motion of a passive object like this swimmer here in the temperature gradient. Uh, so you have temperature gradients again across the interface, and you can measure then uh, position orientation and everything of that particle. So the only difficulty is here how to hold a single particle close to that. We have not multiple particle effects. I mean, we can have many particles like that and probably extract it from that, but we would like to see the pairwise interaction just only. And the way we do that is a technique which we call photo nudging. Maybe it should come here. Uh, to show you that, it's pretty simple. Uh, so these swimmers, as I've shown in the, the movie before, and you see another one here, not in false color scale, they do rotational motion and the uh, deterministic motion along the particle axis. And once the orientation changes in a way that you can uh, face a certain target position, which is this one here or the circle here, uh, then you just switch on the uh, propulsive motion and the particle uh, creates a push or gets a push here towards the target. So it does then this active motion. And when the orientational motion uh, re uh, de uh, de aligns that again with the target, you are in this situation, you switch off the heating and you just wait uh, until the particle is reoriented. So you let the rotational uh, diffusion actually do the work for you to realign the particle in the proper way that you can then propel it in a certain direction. And by doing that, you can keep it either here at the target, move that along a path, whatever you want uh, at small scales. And if you do the math here uh, right, then you will even find out that it's better to have a smaller particle because the reorientation scales with the volume and the translational diffusion, which tries to keep that away from the target actually scales only with the radius uh, of the particle, the inverse radius. So smaller particles can be controlled even much better. So all of the particles you will see in the following is just one micrometer in size, and we use the technique here to, you can see that in a, in a live version, to bring the particle close to the heat source. Yeah? So you have your uh, swimmer, which you would like to study in orientation uh, with respect to that heat source here. When, whenever it leaves an outer radius, you, you bring that back into an inner radius, then you switch on the heat source here, wait a certain while to get rid of any kind of biases, then study the motion of that particle, and bring it back again, and you, do that, you can do that automatically in principle. You see here several trajectories of these experiments, and if you have <coughs> collected enough statistics of orientation and uh, uh, position and speed, you get the following three main results, I, I would say, for these kinds of real physical interactions. So we are on the real physical interaction set. So the first one is a repulsion. Yeah? In our case, uh, the particle is made out of polystyrene. The polystyrene just likes to go to, from the hot to the cold. So whenever you bring that close to the heat source, it will be pushed away. And here you see the velocity of that uh, particle with respect to that uh, heat source as a function of the distance scales with 1 over r squared. The reason is that the temperature gradient, which is created by that kind of heat source, scales with 1 over r squared. You see that here also at different orientations of the particle. So depending on the orientation of the particle to the radial direction, you get different speeds. This is also understood because uh, this is more thermophoretically active than this one here, the old side. And therefore, if this here is closer to the heat source, uh, even so, it's at the same position, you get a higher speed. So this is uh, 108 over, should be a zero degree here in that case. And uh, uh, if you change the orientation, it will get just slower and uh, bigger again. Yeah. What you get as a second component is, the, uh, is an active rotation. So if you place a particle here and it's not oriented in the radial direction, something like that, for example, uh, this temperature gradient will cause a different flow here at the uh, surface than on this side. So therefore, you, you create a rotational motion of that particle, or an active realignment of that particle. You can measure that as a function of distance. You get these two kinds of branches because in one case it moves just in this direction, in the other case it moves into the other direction. So this is the angular velocity as a function of the distance. I think that's the first time people see uh, the uh, realignment in a temperature gradient. Yeah. Um, also scales with 1 over r squared, so the dashed dot lines you see here is just theory in the same way as here, uh, which can be uh, fitted if you know the mobility parameters. And the third one is adjusted polarization or alignment. Uh, so that means if you have a particle here close uh, 
uh, to that one, you see a preferential orientation with the polymer side away from the, from the heat source. So it will be always oriented like that. So that's the probability to find a certain orientation. Zero degree means here the polymer side is uh, pointing away. And you see that here, the polarization for different distances. So the, if you are close, at 1.1 micrometer away from the heat source, you will see a stronger polarization. And it dies out after about 4 micrometers. So, you see here, in all of these cases, the length scale of this interaction is about five, 4 micrometer. It, it's just sporadic in its interaction, so you need a gradient. In our case, it's a temperature gradient. Uh, but uh, it would work in the same way, probably here also with an attraction for all other sporadic mechanisms. So what kind of sporadic uh, swimmer you have, you will, uh, I, I bet, always find the same kinds of interactions. And the most important one is probably that you have an alignment even in these systems. And if you don't believe me that this is also true here for pairs, you can also do the same kind of experiments, uh, only much more difficult, with two generous particles, bring them close to each other. And you see a control experiment uh, where the heating is off for both, and you switch on the heating, you see also the polarization uh, effect we have shown before. So this is only <coughs> a, a more, much more difficult measurement because you have to control these two. Yeah? So this is for the real part. So these are the three elements of the real uh, interactions. I still have some seconds. OK, that's great. <laughs> a minute. OK, a minute. Then I would uh, shortly come to the uh, virtual interactions, uh, or uh, yeah, what I would call them. So you've seen in this photo matching experiment that we can push a particle towards a target. Essentially, this means that we have a kind of effective flow field uh, of the particle towards a certain target position, which you see in the middle here, also in the middle. That's from the experiment, actually, from that experiment. And we finally end up uh, with a positional distribution of that particle, which is just this. So if I would just give you this one here, you would think this is created by a body force, which is holding the particle somewhere in the potential. So we can create some kind of virtual potential, which is certainly not there. It's only uh, made out of a, a spatially dependent uh, velocity. Yeah? So if you think of a velocity which goes down to a certain minimum value here and then up again, you would see that your particles accumulate in these positions where you have uh, a lower velocity. It's just due to the fact you have a deterministic motion, and then the probability is uh, scales with 1 over the velocity. And then you end up, if you compare that to some, some kind of virtual potential, you can extract from that probability distribution you have a the logarithm of the velocity distribution, which gives you that kind of uh, uh, form here at the end. So the only thing you have to do in an experiment now is just to scale the velocity as a function of the distance from the target. So let's say this is a target. And uh, you can uh, take this distance here. Want to create a harmonic potential at that, that distance. You need a velocity scaling, which looks like that here. Negative uh, means just you're pushing inwards. Positive means you're pushing the particle outwards uh, if it has the right orientation. And if you do that, you can measure here the velocities also of such a particle and the probability distribution, which is here, the asymmetric nuclear lightning. And then you get here a Gaussian distribution for the uh, uh, probability distribution and, of course, a potential which is almost uh, um, harmonic, as in this, this case. And, of course, the target can be also now uh, second particle, by that you can couple multiple particles. It's not only that you can uh, uh, do that on one particle, we think we can do that up to hundreds of particles, and uh, I'm, I'm almost done with that. Uh, uh, in, in that way, here with these generous particles, and the only uh, disadvantage of the generous particles is that they have an intrinsic time scale, which is the rotational diffusion. Um, you can get rid of that by having a particle which is symmetric. And you just heat on one side, as in this case here, uh, shown in the last slide. So with that, I think I'm done. I'll show you just a summary. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. I see one, two, three. So thanks for your nice presentation. So I have a question. So for a single gold genus particle size the optical trapping, have you ever calculated the pure optical force uh, in addition to, I mean, we understand that there will be some thermal effects, but have you calculated the differences of the two ends of the optical force differences? Uh, uh, we've not calculated. Of course, we have a radiation pressure, and the radiation pressure pushes the particle to the substrate. 
But the uh, laser is not tightly focused so that we can illuminate a larger area and the gradients on the particle are rather low that we can exclude really the, uh, the uh, optical trapping forces on that. All right. So if I understand correctly, actually in your case, your light is unfocused or not? Uh, it's yeah. not uh, completely unfocused, but it's not tightly focused that we would trap the particle with the optical forces. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when, when Greer did this with the colloidal particles that are not active, um, because the particles were lighter, they tended to rise from the surface and then they saw this effect of attraction, but it was really due to the hydrodynamics. Now yours are on the surface, right? So, but there's still maybe some hydrodynamic coupling between the particles. In which, in which case, with the uh, swimmer and the others around? Between any of the particles. Yeah, they're also, I mean, uh, um, uh, if you have multiple swimmers and they are active, of course, you have a hydrodynamic coupling. But in case uh, you just take a heat source and a swimmer, which is passive, we switch off the hydrodynamics. That's the intention of the experiment, just to look at the phoretics. Yeah? And you can do now the same kind of thing with uh, both hydrodynamic flow fields switched on, and then look at the coupling uh, additional effects of the hydrodynamics. That's the way to sort out, actually, the hydrodynamics. There was another question back there? Uh, Answer. Okay, then. Yeah.